please stand as the procession is about to enter the venue. Nee, toe ek een keer vergeet het, sit asjeblief. <laughs> Please be seated. And it is my wonderful duty and pleasure to welcome everybody who is here this evening and I'm going to welcome some people in particular but perhaps before I do that, I just have to tell or inform you who I am. So my name is Vickers van Niekerk and I have the privilege of being the Dean of the Faculty of Engineering of, of Stellenbosch. So uh, I will do the introductions, uh, sorry, I will do the welcome and I will do the introductions as well. Um, we have quite a number of distinguished guests here and we've got to start with our Deputy Vice Chancellor Research, Innovation and Postgraduate Studies. Um, Professor Eugene Kluter over there, and he told me that this is the last inaugural addresses that he will officiate at because he's, he's not retiring, he's rewiring as he told us last night, but he is um, ending his second term as DVC. So Eugene, thank you very much for being here. We're really honored that you are here. And, um, and Jonathan, as we know, you know, the Faculty of Engineering is always first, but in this case we're also last, as this being the last opportunity that we have, Eugenia. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for all the number of years. I think of all the DVCs that we had before in Orgrals, you were probably the one by, by far with us the most, so uh, thank you very much for that. Um, we also have the honor of having the two heads of department here, so Professor Engelbrecht and Professor Van der Spey, so, so welcome specifically to you as well. I'm looking for my vice deans. The one vice dean lost her voice, so she's looking for a voice, but I can't see my other vice dean. But if he comes in here, Professor Mayer would also um, be here. I have the honor of welcoming our two speakers. So the one is Professor Cornei Kutsia, Cornei, um, welcome here, and we're looking forward to, to listen to you. But then also we have to welcome, I've got to find all the people, um, Desiree, his wife, who is here. So thank you very much for supporting him, not only tonight, but you know, in this career. My wife will, will commiserate with you how difficult it is to be the wife of an academic. So thank you very much for supporting him. So like the director always says, you know, be, behind every successful woman um, is a very surprised, sorry, after if, behind every successful man there's a very surprised wife, so I'm, I'm sure you're not also <laughs> very surprised. And, and also, um, Mr. Krukutsia, um, welcome you by all, it's by a blade that, that yellow work is so is. Then, um, and there's Professor Mayer as well, who I thanked, or who I welcomed in abs absentia here as well. Then um, Professor Rongji Wang, Rongji, welcome here, and we also look very much forward to, to listen to you. Also a valued colleague over many years here in the Department of Electrical and Electronic Engineering. And we have his wife here, Liang, welcome. And we have his two wonderful kids, kids here, Wahi and Yachi, so welcome to them as well. Sorry, they are over there. And then specifically we're going to welcome them because this is going to be recorded. Also the parents, Sing Ru and Gwen Hong of um, Professor Wang, as well as his mother-in-law, Ling Ju. So welcome to them and we are very honored that you will eventually also see this video and have the pleasure of enjoying the inaugural lecture of Professor Wang. He also asked us to mention that his mentors, Professor Martin Kamper, which is over there, Martin, he has a nice name, he has a nice big name, very thank you that he is. This is a true, it's not just your daughter of you, no. Nee. <laughs> and then also I've been told that um, Professor Jack Giras, which is originally that you met at UCT, but he's also one of your mentors, and Jack, uh, we believe that you are online, so you're also welcome here. 
And then, of course, all the colleagues of electrical and electronic engineering, of mechanical and megatronic engineering, a number of them are here in the room, so you also um, welcome. And I also have to mention ABB Corporate Research in, in Sweden, which we also trust may be online. And ABB is a valued partner, industry partner of the Department of Electrical and Electronic Engineering and also supporting the research um, of Professor Wang. And then former students, Dr. Gerber, Dr. Sorgdrager, Tlali, and Chama, who are all online. So thank you very much for, for joining us online as well. So hopefully there, I've now welcomed everybody, but I also want to welcome everybody which I haven't called by name. You are welcome to be here with us. Then it's my pleasure to first introduce Professor Kurnay could see it to you. So Professor Kutsia is a professor in the Department of Mechanical and Megatronic Engineering. He grew up on a commercial fruit farm, which is, and, and you will hear that that sort of carries through in the rest of this introduction, um, which also served as a base for the family's earth-moving construction company. And you will, you will see the, the reference to that later in his, in his talk. And he was exposed to heavy machinery, so we had lots of fun driving on this heavy machinery as well and moving off soil. So um, as a final year project on this topic became available, he discovered his passion for research and a wider interest in the behavior of granular materials in general. And his research focus on the modeling of granular material or bulk solids using various numerical techniques and predicting their behavior for the design of improved handling equipment and processes. He has established a laboratory for observing and measuring material behavior, calibration and validation of these um, numerical models, and I think we're going to see a number of that um, this afternoon. The equipment used for research purposes is also providing a service to industry, right? So, um, Professor is well aware that we have to bring in third income to the faculty to support our research. So we're very happy that there are some earth-moving companies that spend some of their money here with us. Um, but he's also aligned with his research in, or his interest in agriculture involved in modeling and design of paperboard packaging for the horticultural sector. And he works closely with the faculty of agri-science. And I can also say, Cornet, from our side, that's really appreciated that you work outside the boundaries of the faculty of in engineering. And I think that is a very good attribute, which I think that a lot of other colleagues can also aspire to. He's registered as a professional engineer, which is a little bit contentious in this faculty for some reason, but it's a fantastic opportunity that we are having here. And, uh, and registration as a professional engineer is really important. And then he's a B-rated NRF um, um, researcher as well. And I think that for people that know, getting a B-rating is not that easy. So, Cornet, with that as introduction, you're more than welcome to step up here and uh, address this auspicious audience here, as well as all the colleagues online. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Vikas. Um, so, as Professor Vickers said, um, I also do research uh, in agricultural engineering where we mainly look at packaging, um, paperboard packaging. Um, but what I'm going to present to you today is my main research focus, um, and it's also close to my heart, as Professor Vickers has mentioned, and as I will also show to you. So there are a lot of videos in this presentation. Um, Jonathan gave me difficulties. The PowerPoint is over one gig. So they don't all run smoothly. So just bear with me. Um, this first one hasn't got the best of quality. Um, but that is because the original video was taken more than 40 years ago. And last night we projected this on a screen and used a cell phone to get this recording to you. So as Vika said, I grew up on a fruit farm, which was also the base of a, for our family earth moving or construction company. And at some stage you will see me and my sister running there. I'm the one with the blonde hair. Um, so growing up with these machines, I guess it's not a big surprise that I ended up right here studying mechanical engineering. And up until my third year, I wasn't 100% sure what I will do once I graduate. And at the end of our third year, uh, the list 
for our final year projects was released, the Scripsies. And there was one on that list that said something about earth moving equipment, soil modeling of soil. So obviously I needed to get my hands on this project. And the process worked the same as it works today. A student can't select a specific project. You have to list a number of projects and then they get allocated based on merit. So being shy, not speaking to my lecturers unless spoken to, um, I gathered all of my courage and went to see Mr. Els, Mr. Dani Els. So I gave him my background and to, the, to this day I'm not sure what happened behind the scenes but I ended up with this research project for my scripty. And when I started out with it, I just immediately know, knew and I had my answer what I should do once I graduate and that was to continue with the masters. I just knew I had to do research. So I continued also under Dani's supervision uh, to do a master study and there I used a discrete based modeling technique. And towards the end of my masters, I again asked Dani, or I told him, look, I'm interested in doing a PhD, but what should the topic be? And he said, if you can do what you did for your masters, where you use a discrete based approach, but now use a continuum based approach, that should be sufficient for a PhD. So that's basically the whole story, how I ended up from running between bulldozers uh, to modeling soil using continuum and discrete based approaches. So on that point, some acknowledgements. Um, I want to thank industry, academic and all funding partners. I have some of their logos, logos here, some of them are attending online. I want to thank my colleagues from M&M &M mainly and specifically as I've mentioned Dani Els but also Anton Basson who provided me with opportunities and from whom I learned a lot as a young researcher and academic. I'd like to thank my students, postgraduate students, past and present, some of them are attending. Without your hard work, coming up with bright ideas, my research would not be able to continue. That's that word again, continuum, continuous research. And then also my family and friends, some of whom are attending in person. My dad provided me with opportunities to come and study here. And then specifically my wife, also for her, that word again, continuous support. Okay, so let's move on to the granular matter, granular materials. Now if you go and search on Wikipedia, it will tell you that a granular material is a collection of microscopic individual or discrete particles. These particles interact, they make contact with one another, and there's usually energy dissipation in these contacts, mainly due to frictional losses. Now also granular materials are everywhere in nature. Um, second to water, it's the most used resource by us as humans on Earth and the handling of these materials consume about 10% of all the energy that we produce. And it's also estimated that we waste about 40% of the capacity of plants to process and handle these materials due to a lack of understanding and being able to predict the behavior of these materials. So on that note, I want to show you how often we encounter granular materials or materials that were in the past or will in the future be in a granular form. So let's look at a typical working day for most of us. So early Monday morning your clock sounds to mark the start of your work week. Now the clock and many of the items that you will handle and encounter during this day is made from plastic. And plastic is recycled. And before this plastic can again be used to build something else, it will be processed into this granular form called pellets, plastic pellets. So at some stage, or either in the past or future, most of the plastic objects will be in this granular form that needs to be handled, stored, transported, and so on. And for that we need machinery, which we need to design, hopefully in an optimal way. Then you have breakfast, and on this day, some cereal. That's if you 
don't believe too much in what the milk says. So these cereals are already in granular form, or are in granular form, in their final form, the way you buy it, either flakes or whoops or whatever the case might be. But we know that these are all produced from agricultural grains, again, granular. And we know that these are planted in soil, granular, that needs to be worked, tilled, and then the grains need to be harvested, transported, stored, conveyed, processed, using specialized equipment that needs to be designed once again. So we need to understand the behavior of these materials. Again, ignoring the notes, you add some sugar to your cereal, which again is in a granular form, but even the sugar cane can be considered a bulk solid material um, in a fiber form, and we can also try to model that. Then, of course, you can't go without coffee. Now, coffee, since it is harvested until just before you add the water, is almost always in a granular form, whether you buy the end product as coffee beans, ground coffee, or even instant coffee. While enjoying your coffee, you stay out the window at the rising sun. The window is made of glass, and the glass is made of sand. And we need a lot of sand to produce all of the glass we need on Earth. The rest of your house is built from brick and concrete. Concrete contains aggregates, sand, gravel, cement powder, mixed together, all granular. Depending on your health, you might take some medication. And in the pharmaceutical industry, most of the materials are at some stage in a powder or granular form. You add some jewelry, okay, made from gold, diamonds, silver, you name it, mined from the earth. And we need to move a lot of tonnage of earth for a kilogram of these minerals. Then you commute to work, either by train or by car. If it's by train, well, it won't be the blue train, but still, the tracks are laid on carefully selected gravel particles. If it's by car, you travel over the pavement, made from layers uh, of different granular materials, carefully selected with specific properties. Now, whether it's by train or by car, these consist mainly of steel, made from iron and metals and other minerals, and again, all of those mined from the earth, moving tons and tons of granular materials. So at some stage, your car being mainly made from steel and plastic would at some stage have existed almost completely in a granular form. You'll consume some electricity during the day. Uh, it might not depend only on your own demands, but also ESCOM's availability. Most of our electricity is generated from uh, coal. And again, I don't have to explain the processes of mining coal. And of course, you'll have some more meals during the day. And most of the food that we consume at some stage exists in a granular form. So I think that makes it clear um, that we encounter granular materials on a daily basis. So the question is, can we model these materials? Now, we are familiar with the normal for well-known states of matter, solid, liquid, and gas. Granular materials are different. The same granular material can behave like a solid, or a liquid, or a gas, depending on the conditions, and anything in between. And that makes it difficult to model and to predict the behavior. So there are two approaches that we can use, a discrete-based approach or a continuum-based approach, and that's basically the main topic of this, of this talk. But we do not only try to accurately predict the material behavior. In the end, we want to do that and then to use that information to design better equipment um, and machines and processes. So in the end, that is, that is what we are aiming for. So let's start by looking at the continuum-based models. So if you look at the steel components here on the left-hand side, then by the naked eye, the material completely fills the space. There are no gaps or hole, holes in the material. But if we look under a microscope, we see the picture on the bottom left. So a definite crystal structure. We can call it particles, and there might even be small gaps in between. Um, so 
the question is, should we include this in our model or not? And the answer is that if we are only interested in the larger scale, then we do not have to explicitly include these particles in our model. So what we do is we take a control volume, which is orders of magnitude larger than these particles, and based on conservation principles, mass, momentum and energy, we derive a set of differential equations describing the motion of this control volume, which is much larger than the particles. And then we can solve that and solve the macro, the bulk behavior of these materials. So the effect of the particles are still embedded in there somewhere through a constitutive model, but we don't include these particles um, explicitly in the model. Now, that kind of makes sense for something like steel, but can we do the same for the sand, for the granular material, where these particles are definitely visible with the naked eye? The answer is yes. So we can look at these geotechnical applications. Um, on the left, we've got a foundation with an experiment. On the right-hand side, a failing retaining wall. The experiments are done with sand, so at this scale, we know there are discrete particles, but we can't really identify them. So, at the scale that we are interested in, at the scale that we need to model, we can ignore the particles, or we don't need to explicitly add them to our model. We can solve it at a larger scale. So the behavior here is almost, you can imagine this being a soft solid, or what you would consider a solid, or maybe even a, a fluid, a liquid. In bulk solid handling, which is in application terms slightly different from geotechnical applications, we can still do the same. So this is a hopper discharge, material flowing out. If we look at the main body of the material, yes, we can identify the individual particles, but the behavior in bulk is like a continuum. So we can still use a continuum approach to model the bulk of the material. Towards the discharge, we get definitive discrete nature, where the particles lose contact, make contact again. In the main body, they remain in contact. So the effect of the individual particles are not so significant. So, now that we've established that we can use a continuum-based approach to model granular materials, we need a numerical tool to solve all of those differential equations. I've got one here, I think it's the only equation in my whole presentation. That's the momentum equation, uh, which we need to solve. So, the one approach is to make use of the finite element method, or FEM for short. So, in FEM, we divide the material into small little elements, with a finite size, hence the name finite element method, and we can then solve this equation for the solution at the nodes, those are the corner points of these elements, and then we can interpolate, okay, so we assume a polynomial for the displacement, for example, in each of these elements, linear or higher order polynomials, and we can interpolate to find a continuous solution, we can find the solution, whether it's velocity, stress or strain, you can find it at any possible point within this element. So it's a peer continuum based solution. Now, when we look at bulk handling specifically, as we've seen in the examples, um, we've got large displacements and deformation. And this is again a geotechnical application. Now, geotechnical engineers have used FEM to model soil and soil mechanics for decades. This is an example of a vertical embankment that fails and the simulation could go only up to that point and then it gave this message, uh, illegal geometry. So the FEM can predict that this wall will fail but it can't model the post failure behavior. It can't model where this material will end up as shown in the picture here where that, that slope failed. So FEM is kind of limited. It can predict initial failure, stability, but not post-failure flow. And in bulk handling, we are specifically interested in modeling that flow. So, FEM is limited, so we need other ways to do that. So, the one is to make use of MPM. This is the material point method. Now, it has its origins in the modeling of fluid flow, and it was first applied to solid mechanics around 94, 95, and I started to work on this uh, about five years later um, as part of my PhD studies. 
it is classified as a continuum based method, although in the movies you will see it looks kind of discrete like, but it is definitely continuum based. It's also called a meshless finite element method, not completely so, but the deformation is not mesh dependent, or if you know the terms, it's a combined Euler Lagrangian approach. So, for my colleagues working with FEM, um, I'm just going to do two slides describing the basic concept of MPM. So, we want to model this light grey shaded body of material and it is discretized, that means divided up into small little zones using the material points. So the black dots, those are the material points. We don't use a finite element mesh, but we use these material points. And all of the state variables are recorded and calculated at these material points. Velocity, mass, the stress and strain and all of those. And then we also have a background finite element mesh shown by the lighter square markers. Um, and we solve the equation of motion at these nodes identical to what we do with the finite element method and we also apply boundary condition, conditions at these nodes. Then we have a time cycling sequence, so starting from the top left the first step is, since we've got these double discretization technique basically, the Euler-Lagrangian approach where the part, the material points are Lagrangian and the background mesh is Eulerian, we need to map the material point variables to the nodes. So basically momentum, mass and velocity. And that provides us with the initial velocity at the, at the nodes. Step number two is then to solve the equation of motion. So we solve, we have a mass matrix, forces and so on, we solve for the acceleration of these nodes, um, which we can explicitly integrate to find the updated velocity. Then bottom left, the third step, now we've got updated velocities at the nodes, so we map those updated velocities back to the material point. Um, there are different techniques to do this, and then we can also calculate velocity gradients from which we calculate and update the material point stress and strength. Then the last step is to update the material point position. Um, and at this stage we have all of the state variables updated at these material points. So there is no need for the background mesh to remain. So one can delete it, you can modify it, but for practical purposes we just keep the mesh as it is and then we again map the material points to the elements because they can now cross over from element to element. All right, so that's the basics of MPM. Now, I started to work on MPM as part of my PhD about 20 years ago and ever since I've helped a number of academic and non-academic um, institutions to implement their own MPM code. Um, and I'm most excited about the last one, which is in collaboration with Itasca Consulting Group. They are a consulting firm from the United States in Minnesota, but they also develop their own software, and the Duke Technical Engineers might be familiar with FLAC. It's a finite volume approach, but from the outside it looks and appears exactly like FEM. And then they also have PFC, which is the discrete code that we use and have been using for almost 20 years. Now we are implementing MPM in the existing environment, which is nice. We don't have to worry about the graphical interface. We also added a penalty-based contact uh, model, which I'll show you. And all of this is still in, in development. So I'm going to do what I can't do at technical conferences, and that is to show you only the nice pictures and videos. Um, but you can believe me that all of these, most of these, were validated and verified. So, this is an example of a cantilever beam. There's nothing granular about this. It's a beam fixed at the one end and a load applied at the other end. So, on the left, we have what we call standard interpolation MPM. So, you actually see these material points. These are not particles. These are integration points or discretization points. And we can interpolate between these to get a continuous solution of all the state variables. On the right hand side, this is a more advanced MPM technique, CPDI2, 
where we also define a domain for each of these material points and we can track the deformation of the domain for each point individually. This allows us to apply a load perpendicular to the surface which is nice but this now is now again somewhere between a meshless and a mesh based method because you can also get large mesh deformation with something like the CPDI2. With a standard MPM approach, which has other difficulties, we can model unlimited deformation. Okay, so this one I've done specifically for some of our researchers in MPM. Um, this is an indentation problem, uh, where a cylinder is pushed into this elastic material, and like with FEM, we don't need any special techniques such as uh, remeshing. And this can also be viewed as a foundation, it won't be cylindrical, but a foundation on soil, for example, where we can do a really large deformation. So yeah, again on the left, I've got the finite element solution of this vertical embankment that fails and it could go only up until about that point. And if we do the same with MPM, you'll see that it can predict the initial instability, the failure, but also the post-failure flow of the soil. And then again, for this experiment, the retaining wall, we can see that as the wall falls back downwards, um, it models the flow of the soil, um, almost like a liquid. This is another example. This is an experiment that we of often do with granular materials to measure the angle of a repose. That is the natural angle that the material forms with the horizontal, which is a unique characteristic of most granular materials. So next time you play with sugar, you can form a little pile and see how high you can get that angle. And if it becomes unstable, if it's possible to get it even higher, it shouldn't be. All right, so this is just showing the capabilities of MPM to model this really large deformation uh, of a material. This one is silo discharge, so we use the Mercoulomb model. So I should mention that all of the constitutive models available in FEM are also exactly available in the same manner in MPM. So this is a Mercoulomb material that fails. On the left hand side we've got an internal friction angle of 5, so you'll see the free surface at the bottom is about horizontal. Once the material settles, on the right hand side it's an, at an angle of about 25 degrees, which is due to that different properties specified. This one is cone penetration, uh, something that is very difficult to do with a finite element method. Again, this is a purely continuum solution. You can get the large deformation. Uh, MPM is also often used to model pile installation, foundation piles, either being pushed or hammered in due to the fact that it can model the large deformation. Um, and from this we can now predict the force, the upward force for example, that will act on this cone or if it's a pile we, need, we can calculate the force that is needed to push the pile into the soil. One nice feature of MPM is that it provides what we call automatic no-slip contact. So if we discretize two different bodies, we use the same background mesh, the light shaded area, you will get one solution, one single velocity field, which means that these different bodies can't interpenetrate and you get no-slip contact. So there's no friction, it's as if they stick together at contact but there are ways to relax this and to also introduce friction. This is uh, an example of an open pit mine wall that failed in the United States. This is an ongoing project with Itasca Consulting. Um, the mine wall on the left, it's a couple of hundred meters high. It looks small, but it's, it's, it's really large. Um, and it failed and they knew beforehand where the minerals were and after the failure they wanted us to tell them where they should start to dig to get to the minerals as quickly and easily as possible. So we did an MPM analysis of that and here you can really see the large deformation modeling capabilities of MPM. Now as I get to the end of the, the continuum based models for us to model accurately, we need material properties. 
And since we are not explicitly including the particles in our model, the properties that we need are all at a bulk or at a larger Mach level. Um, and that is where we use constitutive modeling, exactly the same as in the finite element method. It can be elastic, it can be elastoplastic models. Um, and luckily for us, the geotechnical engineers have worked on this quite a bit, so they've developed different testing techniques to measure these properties at a bulk level, and we can then use that directly as input to our model. If you have more complicated constitutive models, you might need to calibrate it, but the more simple ones, you can do a test, you get a parameter, and you use that exactly as is in the model. And I mention it here specifically because that is one of the difficulties when we get to the discrete-based methods, which is up next. So, sometimes we simply cannot ignore the effects of the individual particles. We have to include them in the model. And I've got two examples here, but there are more. So, the one is screening. So, if we screen the particles for size, we have individual particles falling through these holes. We need to include those particles. Continuum-based will not work here. And on the right-hand side, we've got flow segregation, but it can also be mixing. So you'll see the larger, the darker colored particles tend to end, end up towards the sides of the container and the smaller particles in the center. This is something that is very difficult to model with a continuum-based method. If the segregation is due to density, yes, we can use a continuum-based method, but sometimes they have the same density but the particle sizes are just different and then it becomes difficult. So then we need to include these particles somehow in a model. So luckily for us, there is a numerical tool for this. It's called the discrete element method. So we've gone from FEM to DEM to MPM. So this one is called DEM. Um, and here we model the actual particles individually. Um, and we then allow these particles to make contact. And most of the contact models are described by a combination of these relatively simple elements. Spring, damper, sliders, or friction um, elements to model the, the material behavior. So when we compare them to something like MPM, the theory behind it is way more simple. But to get a them model to be accurate takes a lot more uh, experience. So, the time cycling is shown here. So, what the code does is, in the first, the first step is to do contact detection. So, we allow these particles to overlap slightly. It's called the soft particle approach. So, the first step is to detect all of these contacts between particles, identify the contact in pairs. Then we calculate contact forces based on the overlap and the stiffness. Then we get the resultant force on the particle. We integrate it once to get the velocity. We integrate it the second time to get the position update. And then we just continue. Again, detect new contacts, calculate new overlaps, and so on. So the first step in DEM modeling would always be particle size and shape. So we've done a lot of research to try and determine how accurately should the shape be modeled. And for our applications, bulk handling kind of application, the answer is not very much. So in this case, what we call the four and eight clumps, the last two columns, those particles would be more than sufficient to model the physical particles scanned and shown in the left-hand column. Um, the second thing is size. So we are limited in terms of computing power. We can't include all of the particles. If we want to model a handful of sand, we need millions of particles, which we simply can't do. So we need to make the particles larger so that we need less particles in the model. And we've again done a lot of research on this to determine what is the maximum we can scale it up, but still somehow capture the discrete behavior of these particles in the model. So you can see here from left to right, well, it's first the experiments and the PIV performed on the experiments. And then we've got modeled at a scale of one to one and then increased scaling. And again, our research shows that we can scale up to a factor of about 1.52. 
So if we scale the particle up by two, it means we've got about eight times less particles in the model. And with the applications we are looking at, um, that's about the maximum we can. Then the next step is to determine all of those spin, damper, friction, element, parameter values. So somehow I need to tell the particles on my computer screen to behave like sand or wet sand or wet coal or my favorite, the wine gums. So somehow I need to tell these particles, you are you wine gums. So um, that's not so easy. For friction, for example, we can take two particles, slide them over each other and measure the friction. But with sand, it's too small. Even if the particles are large enough, we can calculate that friction or measure that friction coefficient. But that will not be sufficient because in the first step we had to make assumptions regarding shape and size of the particles. So since we've simplified the shape, we need a different con friction coefficient than one we'll actually measure. So in the end it's a combination of all these parameter values, size, shape and all of these contact parameters that should accurately predict the bulk behavior. So we have worked on this to um, come up with methodologies to, to calibrate these parameter values and we basically follow the process listed here. We do a lab experiment, we repeat the lab experiment as closely as possible in them and we then adjust these parameter values until we match the bulk behavior that we've measured. Now uh, there's a lot on going behind that word adjust. So there are clever ways to do this. Um, it's not just that easy. If you've got a lot of experience, you can do it iteratively. Otherwise, you have to use some kind of optimization technique to solve um, for these parameter values. And that uh, basically combines with the next statement that we can't just do one experiment to determine four, five, or six of these parameter values. We need to do more experiments. Um, the experiments need to be small, so it can be executed physically and numerically fast, and it also needs to be sensitive to these material properties. Otherwise, we can't calibrate against what we measure. And over the last 20 years, we've worked on this quite a bit to come up with experiments and methodologies to do this in an efficient manner. And I'm again going to share some of those. And again, I'm only showing the nice videos and not all of the details, but these were basically all from masters or PhD studies. So again, we borrow quite a bit from the geotechnical engineers. They have developed shear testers. At the top we've got a rotational and the bottom translational shear tester. We had to design and build bigger ones because these are too small for our large particles. So basically what we do in the left hand video at the top, we've got corn grains in this shear tester, so we measure the shear resistance, measure the torque, and then we do the simulation um, as closely as possible to what we did in the experiment, and we tweak the material parameters until we get the same torque, for example. But we need to do a number of these different experiments because we have so many parameters. This is a easy test to perform. We can measure angles of repose and a mass flow rate. So the material flows top to bottom and at the top and bottom you'll end up with an angle. These angles can be different. In most cases they are. And we can use those angles and the mass flow rate, the time it takes to drain the material from the top to bottom container, to calibrate against. This is an easy experiment. There's, there are no moving components in here. Um, but until someone comes up with it and then everybody says, I should have thought about it. Um, sometimes easier to say that afterwards. This is a dynamic angle of repo, so under dynamic conditions, material might behave slightly different or we need to calibrate some of the dynamic parameters specifically. So we've got your sand, bottom row, left, right, dry, and then added moisture content. And you'll see as we add moisture, the behavior becomes more complex. And adding moisture to granular materials in general uh, create a lot of difficulties for us to try and model it. You can imagine beach, sand, dry and wet, the behavior is totally different. Um, then this is also a static angle of repose or vertical 
displacement. So we've got this platform that we push through the material bed and then the material forms an angle and we can calibrate against this. So at the bottom we've got the experimental results, at the top the model, and the model can predict it. But in the experiment, between 10 and 15 percent saturation, we can't really distinguish between those. So this experiment is not sensitive to higher cohesive levels um, in the material. So the model can predict it, but we can't calibrate against it. We don't know what the value should be. So we try to think, how can we force the material to fail? So we can push at the, at the top and the material will fail and we can maybe use that as a calibration experiment. But that adds additional complexity to our experiment but also to the model. In the model, if you have a wall pushing down, you have additional parameters, contact parameters that are unknown. So we built a prototype centrifuge. Um, to induce additional body forces. And in this way, we can get the material, this is wet, cohesive sand, we can get the material to flow or fail. And now we can calibrate against it, because under 1G it won't fail, but if we spin it up, it will at some stage fail. So I presented this, um, these results at a conference not too long ago, and my German colleagues were impressed but they say that their health and safety regulations will not allow them to build a centrifuge. So we should get these published before they somehow manage to build theirs. Next I'm going to show you some of the applications um, that can be modeled. So once you've calibrated your model accurately, you can model different processes and use that to optimize and design better equipment. So this is a rotary valve. Um, and this graph shows the flow rate of material, kilograms per second, as a function of the rotation speed. And there's a definite maximum, just above 50 RPM. Otherwise, you start to get a return flow. So we can easily use MP, uh, DEM to model this and find this optimum level before we start to build it. We can model mixing. Again, something that is difficult with a continuum-based approach. Um, so one can design specific mixes for specific materials to mix them as fast and quickly as possible if that is what you need to achieve. We've done a lot of soil tool interaction modeling, so dragline buckets, that's basically where everything started 20 years ago. We've looked at soil tillage, adding vibration to the uh, tillage tool to reduce the draft force, for example, and we've verified this experimentally. In the case of soil and other materials, one can, as shown here by the magnifying glass, you can bond these particles together elastically um, and they will remain bonded until the stresses are too high and the bonds will break. So we can model consolidated soil. Conveyor transfers, so we've done a lot of work on conveyor transfers. Um, a conveyor transfer is basically this shoot guiding the material from the one conveyor to the next. In terms of the total cost of a plant, transfer chutes are cheap to manufacture and install. But if it goes wrong and the material builds up and you have to stop the whole plant for days, you will lose millions. So these need to be carefully designed. And we can use the discrete based method to model this. We can predict build up, spillage. We can predict the forces exerted on these uh, chute walls to select the correct liner material. And then we also do scale testing. That is for the third stream income. Um, we've done some modeling on the post-harvest handling of fruit. So on the left-hand side, you see the destemming of grapes. So part of the winemaking process, you need to remove the berries from the stem. And uh, we've done a detailed study on a, on a destemming machine. And, well, it wasn't that easy to build the grape bunch, the bunch of grapes. Um, the upper image shows you the stems modeled by, by bonding these particles together to form a flexible fiber-like particle. And we had difficulties in getting this journal paper published. The one reviewer just simply insisted that this should never be done. Luckily, we got the editor on our side and got the paper published. And now, about 10 years later, 
Most commercial coats can model fibers because we use biomaterials more and more and their fiber model is exactly based on what we did here. We've also modeled apples and we looked at accurate shape modeling of the apples but we can also do more if the apples impact either with one another or any other object we can predict the amount of bruising, the bruise volume and the bruise surface area that you'll see on the skin of the apple we can accurately predict. We can also model the apples, apples in bulk. Um, so this is a water conveyor. These videos should run more smoothly. Um, so we can also model and then in the processing plant we should be able to predict the amount of bruising and try to eliminate or minimize the bruising through fruit and veg or any soft material for that matter. So. Um, Coming to a conclusion, uh, I've shown you examples of both discrete and continuum based models. So there are some applications where the discrete, the MPM approach is definitely best and there are applications where DEM, the discrete method is more applicable. But there are also applications where one can use either of the two and these clips are from my PhD we actually compared MPM and DEM to experimental results and for applications like this one can use either of the two and get, get accurate results but of course each comes with uh, advantages and disadvantages. We've, in our latest application we have also coupled the two so we can have in the same model a continuum based MPM solution for parts of the material and we can also have the discrete particles if that is needed for a specific application. Then, this is the last slide. Um, I want to show you this Disney movie, Frozen specifically, where they accurately animated the snow, but it was not actually animated, but simulated. They modeled the snow with MPM. So they have a dedicated MPM lab where they do research and coding of the MPM. So they do exactly what we try to do to model soil and granular materials and if you look closely, maybe not on this screen, but you can actually see the particles. They have a lot of funding, so they add an additional layer of image processing um, on top of the MPM. So we only show the material points, but they have fancy ways and lots of funding to actually have it look more realistically, but the accuracy of this is similar to what we do with MPM. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Corne. So now it's also my pleasure to introduce um, Professor Rongji Wang in some more detail. So he obtained his MSc engineering degree from the University of Cape Town in June 1998 and a PhD from Stellenbosch in April 2003. He held various research posts at Stellenbosch University from 2003 to 2009 on a part-time basis um, and then um, first as a postdoctoral researcher, then a researcher and then a senior researcher. In 2010, Stellenbosch University made the very wise decision to appoint him permanently as a senior lecturer in the Department of Electrical and Electronic Engineering and he progressed to become an associate professor and then a full professor um, in 2020. In addition to that, he also has seven years industry um, experience working as well as in consulting. His research interest is special electrical machines, novel topologies of permanent magnet machines, computer-aided design and optimization of electrical machines, thermal analysis, electric traction and renewable energy systems. So as you can see, it's quite a wide span, but there is a definite theme there, which I'm sure he's going to share with us um, this evening. He published about 100 papers in international journals and conferences. He's co-author of the monograph titled Actual Flow Permanent Magnet Brushless Machines, which was um, published in 2004 and a second edition in 2008. He is a senior member of the IEEE. He's an NRF-rated researcher and an editorial board member of several international journals 
and also a, prof a registered professional engineer um, with the Engineering Council of South Africa. Professor Wang, we look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professor Fanika. Yeah, uh, my uh, talk for today is on the electric machine technology innovations and research. Yeah, it's a great pleasure to present this talk to yeah to you uh, with your presence. Okay, here is just a quick overview of the content uh, in my talk today. Uh, sorry, I don't have so many videos and pictures today. Sorry, that's probably a mistake. <laughs> All right. Okay, so my field is on special electric machines. Just firstly, uh, what are the special electric machines? If we do a, a word cloud, uh, just typing the word on internet, you, this uh, words come out. Uh, you can see on the graph, you have see the in reluctance machines, magnet machines, and the volume machines, and actual flux machines. So these are typically uh, non-traditional and conventional machines uh, I've been working with. So just to summarize, um, yeah, the background is electric machines field is not, it's not dead, right? It's actually fast progressing. Um, so especially over the past decades, so much progress has been made uh, in the field of electric machine technologies. So this many driven by uh, new materials and new topologies in machine t uh, and drives and also, also driven by more stringent energy efficiency standards. So, so there are many emerging electric machines technologies uh, which are good. However, this also brings about uh, new challenges in the design uh, analysis because some of the existing design uh, serial, analysis serial cannot be directly applied. So my work has been on the technology development and also formulation of design theory, strategy, and also numerical simulation method. Uh, yeah, also includes critical uh, evaluation of special machines. So uh, just a quick summary of past 20 years, my key research activities. So as you can see, I'm very focused. So the actual flux machines took about 10 years. Then the last one, flux modulated machines, takes about another 10, uh, 10 years. So in between, I have this uh, line start PM machines between 2013 to 2017. So when did it all start, right? So this is a picture when I got my PhD degree in 2003, so around about that time, uh, my research gradually uh, yeah, get into this field. So you can see a younger version of Professor Kamper and myself. So, so as now it's 20, yeah, long time passed, so I'm not sure if it gets any wiser, but I'm surely get older. So the first topic uh, I would wish to mention is on the actual flux permanent magnet machines. 
Uh, that's also part of my PhD work. So just some background first. So actual flux machines, they, they're different from conventional machines, as you can see on the, uh, on the graph on the left-hand side. So normal machines is in cylindrical, quite a long cylindrical body, right, like uh, this profile. Uh, actual flux machine is more like a pancake shaped machines. So it has a larger diameter to Nance ratio. And uh, potentially, it claims can uh, realize much higher power density. And uh, it also can accommodate hyper numbers because of large diameter. Yeah, just interesting facts. At the earliest electric machines, they actually there were actual flux machines. Uh, one example is Faraday's disk. Uh, that was uh, in 1831. Now that's really the origin of electrical machines. So traditionally, because of the construction and the design challenges, uh, actual flux machines has been limited to small power. So, so my research was on the large power uh, actual flux machine development with a call as stator. Okay, just some uh, work I think is important come out of this research. Yeah, giving the profile of actual flux machines, uh, it's a flux, it's in 3D uh, pattern, so usually we rely on 3D FEM final element analysis, uh, which are fairly expensive uh, computationally. So another way of doing that is to, um, we can break this machine into a few segments based on magnetic symmetry. Then each segment we can further divide into different layers and then unfold it into uh, linear models. So this can be fully modeled in 2D, so can be time efficient and uh, of fairly good accuracy. So one of the tools I developed, uh, because this actual flux machine can actually be modeled as a linear, linear machine, so one of the work I did was to develop this uh, so-called uh, Condition air gap element. As you can see, uh, we have a meshed air gap. That means it's a purely analytically solved. So then this links with the stator and the rotor um, by just doing this, which enables motion to be uh, modeled, right? So, so the advantage of this uh, method is uh, it's no remission is required during the motion uh, process with a greater accuracy because it's a fully analytic solution. So the original idea wasn't, wasn't mine. It was come from uh, a radio flux machine, but due to the linear air gap, I basically have to reformulate the whole, uh, the whole uh, form, uh, formulation here. Okay, so one the downside with this method is the this larger profiles of this system matrices. As you can see on the figure on the left hand side, this is three dense blocks. They're representing the serverless terms of this uh, air gap element. Uh, in this case, we have three air gaps. So these things can drastically impact the performance of the calculation. And so what we did, uh, there was some techniques we can implement to mitigate um, this uh, issue here. So we just update the motion related terms and using a, a negative boundary conditions, which can uh, improve the speed by quite a large extent. 
And then this comes with a some further development on the force calculations. As you can see the long formula here. So this enables us to calculate the forces of the uh, machine. One application example given here is this actual flux uh, EV motor. We calculate the torque versus current. So fairly good agreement uh, is evident. And the second uh, work I did was on the quasi 3D eddy current loss model. So as you can see, the air gap magnetic field of one uh, magnet disk is showing on the left uh, top side. So if we have winding located in this uh, time varying field, can severe eddy current losses can be in, uh, induced. So traditionally people rely on this single uh, one-dimensional Carter's analytic model, so which is uh, fairly inaccurate. So my work was to uh, propose a multi-slices and a multi-layer model, so make a full use of this Carter's uh, analytic model. So as you can see on the graph here, so we just break the machine into few segments and each one um, break into few slices and each slice is break into few layers. So then we have we achieved fairly accurate calculation. Uh, the comparison is showing on the right hand side. Okay, then I also explore a bit into the thermal fluid analysis of uh, actual flux machines, uh, which I learned quite a lot from uh, Mr. Dobson. So, so for that, uh, the basic assumption was because of the magnets, uh, the channels between magnets, so this uh, disk of F, uh, actual flux machines is similar to a centrifugal fan uh, to some extent. So I was uh, yeah, looking into this uh, thermal um, fluid behavior of the machine and then imply, employ a simple thermal model to do analysis to predict if a machine can really have inherent self-cooling uh, capability. Okay, so with all this study carried out, so we were able to uh, develop a large power coilless uh, actual flux machine. As you can see the construction of the machine uh, in the photo. And this uh, machine realized a very high efficiency and the power density is about 4.43 megawatts per cubic meter. And this was one of the largest uh, actual, actual flux machines ever built uh, at the time. And so it is also evident that the self-ventilation uh, of the machine is also, um, we actually reach a current density of 11 amps per millimeter squared. That's a typically re require water cooling for the machine to, to be operate continuously. But this actually was able to with just air cooling. So that proves this machine has um, self-cooling capability. Okay, one of the milestones from this work uh, was uh, I also co-authored with Professor Kamper, Professor Kiras, on this first book on the actual flux machines. that was uh, uh, republished in uh, 2008. So the second project I wish to uh, talk about is on the line start permanent magnet motors. And this was a project uh, sponsored by Sasso uh, because they have a lot of iron start machines looking to the energy efficiency. So the background is um, this IEC, uh, which stands for International Electrotechnic Commission. They have this uh, increasingly um, high energy efficiency standards for electric machine industry. 
So as you can see here from IE1 up to IE4, so after 2020. So this uh, increasing energy standard, they forcing a machine industry to look into alternative new uh, motor technologies. So, what, so as you can see on the figure on the right, uh, this induction machine basically reaching a, a, a bottleneck, right, the efficiency level, especially for small power, uh, fixed speed this motor drives. They typically use for fan drives, pumps, conveyor belts, this kind of applications. Um, but once we push for high energy standard, you can see on the right hand side, uh, induction machine basically is out. We're moving towards the synchronous motors. So one of the options is to go for uh, non start permanent magnet motor, which is basically the synchronous motor at steady state uh, operation. So in that case, then all the losses in the rotor can be uh, eliminated, so which can offer a high efficiency. Um, but this machine, it is very good at steady state. The challenge is to synchronize this machine from zero speed to synchronous speed. Um, so in that sense, the design of the machine has to incorporate both transient and steady state operations. Uh, which is challenging. This is also you can see on the torque component on the figure on the right hand side. So it's a quite a complex um, uh, situation we're dealing with. So traditionally people design such a machine focusing on steady state. Then uh, the transient status they just mostly by pure luck. They just say, design with test that can't synchronize or not. So it's no control in the design process. And to check on the synchronization, it's running a transient process, running in typical city 40 minutes per solution, which is impossible to use in the design optimization. So I was thinking, can we do using a quick analytic model to quickly get the same uh, kind of order of accuracy? So then this work is about synchronization model. So traditionally people are using this uh, uh, energy method, which is based on slip and the uh, load angle plan, S delta. So they basically, uh, if you see the, the graph on the, in the middle, this yellow lines, there's a lot of ripples on it showing this post slipping before it's reached synchronization. And the last one, which is uh, also marked in blue color, the last post slip is most important because that dictates if machine can be synchronized. Um, so most people fo focusing on this, the last post slip process. So by looking at that one, um, so they're using a simplified sine equation. So this is a sine function, we're using that to integrate find out synchronization energy, comparing with uh, kinetic energy required. So if it's greater than kinetic energy required, then the machine can be synchronized, otherwise it's a failure. So, uh, but there, there were some issues with this assumption um, because uh, we basically lose the history uh, before this, what happens before this point. And also you see the difference between, uh, on the graph below, this blue ones, it's a simplified uh, per sleeping process, and this yellow ones is the true ones, which you, um, which we use for a more accurate calculation. So this work mainly done by Dr. Sharma, one of my postdoctoral students. So what he did was to derive these two models. One is energy-based model, so we basically integrate from uh, time zero, from the beginning all the way to the end. Uh, then we can avoid suggestion like uh, has no solution in the process, which can cause a premature failure of uh, optimization process. So this method uh, he developed to solve this uh, 
with a greater accuracy. So you can see the graph on top. This is the last part is keep it reading that is uh, failed to synchronize. And the bottom ones, you see that's converged to a dot that is synchronized case. Okay, then it's more in intuitive to look in the time domain to solve the same problems in time domain. So this is another algorithm developed by Dr. Sharma. So then you can see the speed versus time uh, for two synchronized and non-synchronized cases. This can be also shown with torque versus speed. Uh, the yellow ones is the one synchronized and the blue ones you can see keep raining. It's, it's no sign of synchronization. And comparing with the uh, FAME simulation, this simulation takes about seconds, not like hours. So then we just evaluate the performance of this model comparing with FAME. Uh, for the first method, we have 100% match. And this time domain method, we still have, uh, we have three failure cases, but mostly matched. So this is already better than the original method used by others. Okay, then we also look into the optimization method because um, I was thinking this design process is a bit of trying and error and we can be affected by many parameters. So I had this idea of looking to um, design of experimental method. It's a more robust design method. So this is Takuchi method come to my attention. And uh, this method is quite special uh, in the sense of it defines quality and have standardized experiments uh, trials. And uh, they also apply robust design strategy. You can design noise array. And there's a set of uh, defined uh, orthogonal arrays you can, depending on the number of parameters and the levels. So this method hadn't been used much in electric machine design. So you can see on this uh, the pie chart here, uh, most people are using this method actually in Taiwan, it's 31%. Then, uh, then Korea and China follows. The rest of the world that includes us, uh, Africa, is about 28%. So, so in Africa, about 3%, that probably is us, right? <laughs> so basically, um, so it's not so many people using this method for electric machine design because there are challenges using this method. And the work done uh, in, this, uh, in this regard is done by uh, Dr. Sakhachak because he was my PhD student. And he really looked into this method for machine design. So there's two challenges with this method. One is they cannot be used for multi-objective optimization and been done before. And secondly, they cannot be used in the iter uh, iterative design process. So, so to overcome this, uh, this Dr. Sakhachak, he, he includes this multi-response compiler. So SS and TS stand for steady state performance and the transient performance. So then he combined both uh, in the optimization. Then he uses dynamic regression rate to alternate the parameter ranges, to alternate this uh, uh, iter iterations. So then this turns us into, probably this is the first time we use this in uh, iterative uh, optimization process. And the results was very good from his work. And so this, uh, many dots here showing is a uh, parental front in the design. And some of design we say is robust design because that's being tested against noise array like, uh, like manufacturing tolerances, material property variances, these factors. So you can see this, uh, a lot of machine geometry uh, generated. Uh, this F01, which means um, we do not care about steady-state performance. We only care about transient performance. 
and the F10 is on the other end. We only care about state-state uh, state performance. We don't care about transient for, uh, performance. The one in the middle is a compromise uh, we chosen is this one marked in a green color. That's the design we selected. So this then we went through the prototyping, the measurement. So everything looks to uh, work correctly. Okay, then the last one is on the uh, flux modulated machines, which I spent almost 10 years on. Um, yeah, this comes from the idea of magnetic gear. Uh, just a bit of short history on this. Uh, magnetic gear, this concept was conceived is more than a century ago, right? It's pretty old. The first pat patent was uh, fired in 1901 by Armstrong. That's probably the first one we know. So the early designs, there are many just analogies of mechanical gearbox, as you can see on the graph, the worm gear just using man's replace uh, T's, right? The same, each version can find the corresponding designs. However, the torque density is much poorer comparing with mechanic, uh, mechanical gear because this magnetic force can't compete with two smashing forces. So, but there is one uh, special design, we call it flux modulated magnetic gear. That is uh, very interesting uh, because this first design was um, was patented in 1916. Uh, that's also pretty early. Then there was some development from 1967, 68, and then people know this works, but no one realized this machine can realize very high torque density. So until 2001, this uh, Dr. Atala from University of Sheffield, he found this talk dense design. He revealed this potential for the flux modulated design. So then since then, it's, it's a lot of interest generated. So I was probably one of the followers since after 2001. I found this very interesting. So just a comparison between magnetic gear and mechanical gears. Uh, we know gears they used very widely in industries. Um, however, they they subject to wear tear, overheating. This require as maintenance, duplications regularly, and also they can be damaged if they have over torque uh, conditions. So magnetic gear uh, is quite attractive because they have low friction, right? It's no physical contact. They have a very low maintenance. Maybe only items is bearings uh, need to be maintained. Then we also have inher uh, inherent overload uh, protection. If it's overload, this pole just slip. It won't cause any physical damages. They have a fairly high torque density. It's similar to two-stage helical gear. I think it's in the same range. And the efficiency can be high. It's on par with the best class mechanical gear. And also, the single stage gearbox can reach 50 to 1 gear ratio, which is also quite amazing. And also, the machining precision tolerance can be also relaxed. Yeah, this is just a summary of activities, uh, research activity uh, in Sandwich University. So since 2009, I started looking to this. Uh, we developed the first flux modulated gear uh, to prototype in Africa. It's also one of the three or four uh, just modern uh, prototypes ever built in the world. Then we just followed with all the, um, a lot of work <laughs> afterwards. Okay, first look at the magnetic gears. Um, so the standard design, uh, there's a pole pieces, which is this gray colored pieces between uh, inner magnet 
rotor and outer magnet rotor, they typically they're loosely placed, so which is quite difficult to to construct. So I had uh, I actually had a patent with for a company at the time. We proposed this linked or bridged uh, this flux modulator design, and so that's all not only simplified construction. There's other um, benefits. If we do analysis, you will see this tends to um, suppress unwanted high harmonic flux harmonics has very little impact on the torque capability. And uh, they actually, this, this uh, kind of design, it seems, uh, becomes mainstream designs. I saw a lot of publication using this design. And uh, then the other thing that we investigated was, um, based on the literature study, we saw this uh, uh, prototypes, this early, say three early prototypes. We can see this Atala, which is in the UK, and this Rasmus thing is in Denmark, and uh, this Brown, which is us. So we designed something we only realized uh, much lower design value, right? In UK's uh, prototype, they realized 70% design value, and in Danish model, they realized 60%. In our case, we have 62% design values. So this actually uh, prompted us looking to the causes for this large discrepancy. And this is mainly is Dr. Herbert's work. So he, I actually asked him to look into this uh, end effects things, but he actually discovered uh, this different flux leakage components. We have this leakage fringing effects, escaping uh, flux components that is very unique for magnetic gears, not existing in any other machines. So that typically happens when we have opposing magnet poles. The flux has no way to go. They could travel in actual direction, escaping from the system. So knowing this effects, we can try to implement design to mitigate these effects by doing um, changing the certain parameters. Yeah, one of the application uh, uh, we investigated was for ACC, this uh, application. That was a part of H2020 project led by Professor van der Spey in mechanical. So I had the opportunity to be part of it, um, to look into magnetic gear technology for this uh, uh, ACC applications. So what we did was uh, we basically design, custom design a magnetic gear and compare with a commercial mechanical gear. As you can see on the right hand side, this testing setup, a two gearbox side by side. So we're doing the comparative design uh, measurements. So it's fairly close, but uh, mechanical gear is still slightly better, right? But 1% uh, high in efficiency. So what we discovered, so the gear we developed has a huge uh, imbalanced magnetic forces. It's almost like a one person standing on the shaft, unidirection forces. So this gives rise to the bearing losses and other losses. Uh, that explains why we have a bit less efficiency. So we did further study uh, together with uh, Dr. Daniel Els and one of his students. Uh, we analyzed imbalanced forces. We actually we proposed the design must be according to the formula given here uh, to realize a balance of forces. So then we developed a new prototype, which we realize uh, you see the efficiency map. We get most area is uh, ninety-five percent. So, which is, uh, it's actually uh, slightly better than uh, mechanical gear, if it's not more, but yeah, very close. Okay, one of the um, interesting design I came across was on this uh, 
magnetic planetary gear, uh, in which this all the green uh, circle they they actually rotational magnets. Um, so we have this modulator being replaced by magnets. So I was thinking this is an interesting idea, but how do we design such machines? It's challenging. So I asked uh, Dr. Herbert to help me. Can we not model this machine using rotational uh, okay, magnets? Can we just only rotate the magnetization vector? And yeah, he came to my rescue. It's, uh, here you are, he programmed this, everything worked. So now we don't have, have to model motion, so that's really much, much simple. So we're using this basic physics uh, principle, energy-based, saying this each um, magnet will settle at a certain position to maintain a you know, minimum uh, magnetic stored energy. So we're using an optimization uh, algorithm to, to optimize these positions. So that's all worked well, um, but we think it's not fast enough. So we continue to look for the preconditioning techniques which are showing on the top. So if we apply these techniques, we can even shorten this design process, make it feasible to use in the design process. Okay, um, then we look at the magnetic geared machines because we think the gear is concentric. If we incorporate gear and electric machine in a single, single volume, we realize a, basically a new class of electric machines. We call it magnetically geared machines. So as you can see, the four um, this cross sections on the right hand side, we can put in gear right inside. Uh, this outside is uh, uh, machine, you see the different magnet flux path uh, in the machine. So we identified the three uh, prominent topologies, like in the stator, out stator, and uh, vernier machines. So to make this, uh, to form a fair ground for comparison, we decided to go about each project's development using the same set of uh, specifications, I get the same speed, same auto diameter, the same thickness, then we can compare this technology. So this kind of design have three, like typically have two, three air gaps. Um, so design is not simple. So Dr. Sian have a device, this kind of design uh, procedure, which works very nice, based on single point uh, and bring in different load factors and also uh, uh, to, to enable design at a fixed point. So this method really uh, is being used also by others. And also uh, we, because this gear and machine in one volume, we actually have one more degree of freedom, uh, which is load angle. So that's also uh, part of Dr. Herbert's work. Yeah, then we just go about just uh, designing each of the topologies, optimum design them within the same dimension constraints, performance, uh, the same speed. So this is the most difficult machines. It's in the stator magnetic geared machines. Uh, you can see the four concentric components, three air gaps. So this machine can realize a torque density about 100 kilonewton meters per cubic meter which is three times of any machine you know in the world. Uh, this, I mean, this is three times of that. So it's very, very high torque density. And the efficiency map and uh, yeah, this machine performance characteristics is showing also here. Then we look at the auto rotor ones. It's a simpler, have two air gaps. Um, yeah, we're building the same prototypes, but this uh, torque density reduces to 60, 70 which is still very high. But now we only have two air gaps, uh, which is simpler. And the third machine we look at is a vernier machine. It's just like a normal machine, single air gap, one stator, one rotor. The magnetic gear is, becomes invisible. You can't see that now. It's, it's into the machine design. So, and this 
features also high torque density, 50, 60 uh, kilonewton meters per cubic meter. It's almost like a double normal PM machine's uh, torque density. So then we build a prototype for testing. And now we can have, a, have three machines developed. We can do a fair comparison between them. Then you can see um, yeah, this different machine has all the pros and cons, with its more structurally complexity, but your performance is, is high, but then it's more expensive to build. And uh, the downside with Verdi machine is the power factor is lower. Uh, that is one uh, disappointment for Verdi machine. But all in all, they actually all good choices depending on different applications. Yeah, this I skip this one. It's just showing different performances. Yeah, so based on that, we were actually interested in this Verdi machine. So we carried on with this PhD project on Verdi machine uh, technology for uh, wind energy applications. So this is a prototype we built. Uh, that's also one of the largest prototype for Verdi machine ever built, and uh, and we just gone through this comparison, testing against conventional machines, showing the performance uh, advantage of this new technology. So f finally, we also look at uh, yeah, we saw this technology quite promising, so we look further into utility scale. Uh, applications, say three, four megawatts. So how this machine uh, perform and that power level. So this study is about that. We're showing um, it's quite feasible to design this machine for uh, high power wind energy applications. Yeah, just to uh, conclude, I just play a small video. I still have a video. So. <laughs> Yeah, this is the prototype for this PM Verde machine. It's, uh, it's Dr. Tani, he's operating this machine for his PhD project. That's uh, bringing to the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Kutsi and Professor Meng, for fascinating uh, presentations and congratulations uh, on your promotion uh, to full professors. It's great to have you here at the university. Uh, I was particularly intrigued, uh, Professor Kutsia, with the uh, way that you predict the behavior of pellets. And you actually reminded me, or it actually was quite an eye-opener, to see how many particles are actually around us. Um, and <clears throat> you clearly demonstrated the value of the different types of models, uh, with the finite element model, the material point method, and the discrete element method, that the words that come out all the time were mass, momentum, energy, velocity, and one could see that in the applications uh, which you uh, indicated there. Uh, it seemed to me that your discrete element method, uh, looking at particle shape and size, uh, and shear was probably the more difficult one uh, to model because of the number of variables that were involved there. And perhaps that's the model you could use to model uh, spectators leaving a stadium. Uh, <clears throat> because these are, according to your definition, uh, also macroscopic individual particles and how they interact. Uh, or even modeling a football game or a rugby game. Uh, so, uh, but well done and I thoroughly enjoyed your presentation. So, Professor <coughs> Wang, the uh, 
You spoke about a, a many emerging electric machine technologies, uh, talking about axial flux machine, machines versus radial flux machines, and, uh, and, and starting off with Faraday's machine uh, many, many years ago. But the one thing that struck me uh, is the complexity of the modeling and the, uh, how expensive that is in terms of computer time and the limitations of, of computer time. And I was impressed by the way that you have innovated and adapted um, your modeling to overcome these limitations. You uh, mentioned a number of applications, but I found it most fascinating <clears throat> when you started talking about, and a lot, large part of your presentation was on the evolution of the uh, electric motor, which finds, of course, its way in applications in e-mobility, electronic vehicles, uh, but also all the way in your last slides to uh, wind uh, to wind energy. Um, and particularly uh, impressive was your demonstration on how to improve uh, the performance, uh, and specifically uh, with regards to uh, magnetic gears versus uh, mechanical gears. I really think that uh, you are working uh, on technologies that will are already important, but will become even more important in the future as we move uh, towards e-mobility and uh, we will see car designs using uh, your technology built into uh, all kinds of applications. But uh, congratulations to both of you. I want to invite you to come and receive a certificate. <clears throat> Professor Kutsir. Congratulations again. Thank you. You may be seated. So I have the opportunity to say a word of thanks, or I should probably say words of thanks. So um, the first people that I want to thank is our, our speakers, uh, Professor Kutsia and Professor Wang, for two very, very interesting talks. Um, I wasn't sure if it was civil engineering or mechanical engineering, but uh, it was good. Um, I then want to thank our Deputy Vice-Chancellor, Professor Eugene Kluter. Um, I think it's a very uh, special talent to be able to sit here and to listen to these talks and then to give such an interesting summary of what our colleagues are busy with. Um, so I thank you very much and we will, we will miss you um, in the, the future inaugural uh, lectures that will happen here. So thank you very much for that. Um, I was also just asked to give uh, specific words of thanks. Um, Professor Kutsia didn't have anyone specific, but I will, I'm sure he is very thankful for the continued support of his wife and the rest of his family. Um, he also mentioned a bunch of companies, so there was a couple of logos there. Um, and then uh, Professor Wang already, you can also read up there, but specifically for his, his parents, his family and friends. His parents are in China at the moment. Um, he will. They'll hopefully be able to view this video at some future point. For his uh, research collaborators and mentors, specifically Professor Martin Kamper um, and Professor uh, Jack Giras. Um, these past and present students, uh, Dr. Gerber, Dr. Klari, Dr. Sorgdraar, Dr. Chama and uh, Dr. Bota. I think Dr. Bota actually got his PhD last year or this year. Um, then for the e and &E Departmental Workshop, who actually manufactures all these prototypes, specifically Mr. Andrei Swart and Mr. Peter Petzer, um, these complex machine prototypes, um, and then his industry uh, collaborators, ABB Corporate Research, Vasteras in Sweden, and specifically Dr. Robert Chin and Dr. Dmitri Zvenskarenko. Um, we also want to thank Sassel University Collaboration Initiative for ESCOM, for the TESS program, the South African National Research Foundation, and then a special mention for two wonderful South African families, the McLarens and the Von Buckstroms, 
who uh, Professor Wang stayed with him during his postgraduate studies at UCT in Salambosch. Then I want to give a special thanks for everyone involved in the arrangements. Um, Mr. Jonathan Dale Blankenberg, from, who's the coordinator uh, from the Registrar's Responsibility Center, for Olivia Adams and Amira Brown um, from the Division of Corporate Communications, for Mr. Justin Alberts, who's doing the recording and live streaming of these two lectures, for the Dean's Office staff, specifically Ulrich, Clint and Jimmy, and Marley, for um, all the preparations to get the rights hall ready for all of us. And then lastly, I want to invite everyone to share in a glass of wine, not wine gums, unfortunately, a glass of wine, um, in celebration of the achievement of our colleagues.